Hello everyone, I'm Pete. I actually flew in um, at 7am this morning, so I was up at 3.30am. Um, so if I... <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> I know there's another one in the audience that I saw at the airport as well. Um, but I might get you guys to just introduce yourselves because I'm very worried I'm going to screw up someone's last name. Um, but within that as well, um, can you also introduce a, and a favourite ad? It can be old, it can be new. Um, we'll start with you, Brett. Fantastic. Um, so my name is Brett Islob. I'm the National Digital Sales Manager uh, for SBS and SBS On Demand. Um, from a, I guess, a uh, ad perspective, I hate to be cliche, but I'm going to go Super Bowl. Um, it was 2002, I believe. Um, Reebok did an ad um, that was centred around um, a generic office where they had hired an NFL linebacker named Terry Tate um, to basically keep staff into line. I don't know if anyone remembers that, but it is a particular favourite of mine. If you haven't seen it, please go and jump on it. Um, not to double down on the Super Bowl piece, but if we're going uh, recent, I think the Tubi piece that happened um, in, I think it was a couple of years ago in the Super Bowl, where they essentially took over the screen and made you feel like you were navigating onto their platform. I thought that was a really clever integration as well. Hi, I'm Caroline. I look after our YouTube and programmatic business at Google. Um, I think in terms of favourite ad, this is a bit controversial because I happened to mention this in my open plan office yesterday. And my immediate thought is the, the one that immediately sprang to mind for me was the Guinness surfing ad. Which, does that mean anything to anybody in the room? Oh, there's a couple, there's a couple. My team immediately were like, no one will ever heard of it. It's also showing your age, it's 25 years old. And thirdly, apparently, I haven't heard it, but Ritson did a talk on creativity at Cannes the other week, and he referenced it as a piece of creative that was lovely, but no one will remember it. And I still do, 25 years later. So maybe I'm just the exception to that rule. Um, team, I feel vindicated that people in the room did know this ad. Um, in terms of more recent one, I think um, one I particularly love was the Apple iPhone ad that they did, but they did an Australian version, which I don't think they that often do. But they, I don't know if you guys have seen it, it's the one where someone's cycling down the road and magpies attack the cyclist, the phone goes falling out of their hand. I loved it because I'm a cyclist. I don't, I don't know if you Aussies realise how quintessentially Australian that experience is. Like, there is nowhere else in the world that ad will mean anything to anybody. So I think it touched on a really cool little consumer insight and something that people recognise. So it was just fun. I haven't bought a Google an iPhone, though. I'm still very much on my Google Pixel. Just so it didn't, <laughs> it didn't work. Maybe in a few years. I mean, it's a, it's a brand campaign, right? <laughs> well, you stole my thunder there a little bit. Um, my favourite ads, this is nostalgia, probably quite juvenile, um, the Nano Shuffle and iPod ads in the early noughties. Did anyone buy an iPod Shuffle off the back of that? Multiple. That is, Die hard. that is a good ad. Die hard. I thought um, the soundtracks, you know, U2 with Vertigo launching, um, simple, simple creative. I was obsessed, so still am. And I'm Maddie. I'm director of CTV Platforms at Mac Knight. Thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Paul Balbo. Um, pleasure to be here with you all today. Uh, I'm the head of industry uh, at Meta for automotive, CPG, and QSR. So have lots of clients that are very invested in the video space. I work with them every day. Um, in terms of my favourite ad, I'm going to go with the recent one, only because it's just kept me entertained for a while and I love humour. But it was the Posh and Beck's um, teaser campaign for oh, Uber Eats yeah. and I just loved it because it was like the honest skit which became a meme which they played in. So I thought it was very interesting, uh, you know, relevant to tap into culture and they just did a brilliant job. Loved it. That was a great one too. Thank you. I'm going to share mine. Mine was... Um, <laughs> I'm going to have to say I'm a bit basic, though, but Yellow Pages, not Happy Jan. Everyone knows that. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. first is the first one that came to my mind, just the brand recall. That one or uh, the Reading and Writing Hotline, because I still remember that number. Does anyone know that number? One three double zero six triple five zero six. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, let's get on to the questions. Um, there's a few topics to cover, and we don't have much time. Um, but let's start on the IAB Tech Lab video that we just saw. So there are obviously recent advancements, um, advanced TV updates. Um, how do you think 
uh, industry-wide standards and collaboration help challenge and increase the confidence across the video ecosystem? Might start with you, Brad, if that's okay. You're going to keep picking on me, aren't you? <laughs> I'm sorry. Best yeah. person no, for it, It's ready. totally fine. Um, look, I think from a from a measurements and standards perspective, like, it keeps us honest, right? Like, it, it has everybody on the same playing field um, and it is a way to, you know, keep... Um, your campaign's accountable, like understand what is the benchmark for what you're trying to achieve in your campaign and then being able to report back on that from an overall perspective. Like I think as long as we're all singing from the same hymn sheet in some way, shape or form and understanding that from a digital marketing perspective, we have been on such a journey from talking about viewability on CTV uh, to like a million other things. Like I think we've got, we've got a decent handle now on what we actually need to achieve from a measurement and standards perspective in this market. And I think we're moving towards that in multiple iterations, but I think it really is that, that broad line of, of you know, accountability and keeping everybody on the same page and understanding what success looks like ultimately. 100%, I would totally agree with that. Um, Maddie, do you have anything on this one? I think just to, to agree with Brett, but also, you know, standardisation is made when there's a problem identified, you know? And I think bringing that process and bringing that, you know, level playing field for everyone is important. Um, I think it brings credibility um, and a bit more um, confidence for marketers and buyers to get on board when there is more standardisation where it's accessible for everybody. It brings scale, it brings confidence. So I think these kind of projects are fantastic. And, you know, we already have such a huge bunch of successful collaborative committees like Think TV, Commercial Radio Australia, Think Premium Digital. These guys work so hard to make sure that standardisation works for everyone. Makes it so much easier for us in the buy yeah, side absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Um, Sticking with you on, yeah. as a follow-up to that one, um, what recently introduced practices or innovation on the, are on the horizon uh, do you think that um, will make a positive impact um, in the digital video market? Yeah, so as we saw in the research piece, measurement is still the pain point for buyers. Um, being a buyer for over 12 years, measurement's always been the hardest part. and. Um, Oztam um, and the broadcasters are coming together to work really hard to make uh, BVOD cross-platform measurement work and happen. Um, with the VOD streaming project rolling out at the end of this year, I think this is a really positive step in the right direction for buyers to be able to um, plan, buy and post-analyse total BVOD audiences together, bringing scale, um, being able to look at unified metrics, TV, TV jargon kind of correlated there. So. Some really exciting stuff happening in this space and I think that will help um, in terms of these total TV, total screen approaches. I'm very thankful TARPs haven't really come into the digital space yet, but yeah. I'm <laughs> so happy. I think it's probably also worth saying on the standardisation, I like completely agree, like it helps drive confidence. I think the bit that will be interesting in the future is this also provides us with enhanced signals, which increasingly people are going to be able to use, you know, across the industry, going to be able to use to drive AI models, et cetera, to drive better mm. targeting, def better bidding. So I think it is both about raising confidence, but I think with a future lens on it, it's also about driving ROI and better results of marketers. So I think yeah. it's got the potential to be really exciting on that front as well, beyond just the confidence piece that it will bring to the industry. Yeah, absolutely. Totally agree with that too. Um, might go to you now, Paul. Um, first one. Um, so, what have been the most significant shifts in consumer engagement with video content in your platforms over the past 12 months? Um, well, the biggest shift for us is short form video. It's always been strong, but it's, I mean, the rise of it's been astronomical in the last 12 months. I think if you looked even at Q4 results last year, video watch time was up by about 25%. It now accounts for about 60% of all time spent across our surfaces. But really, it's the rise of Reels. So Reels has created a whole new video um, offering on our platforms. Um, it's a different type of content. Um, it's more entertainment-led, uh, lots of comedy, creator-led type content. So it really has changed the type of content, the way people are consuming. Uh, it's also brought sound onto the platform. So for the first time ever, um, best practices now include sound on. So we still love text overlays and making sure you're building for sound off, but we, we see sound on more than not now, which is astronomical. You've done a full 180 there. We have, right? Yeah. 
um, keeping everyone on their toes. Um, and I, but I think, it, it, look, it still is inherently social. So we still see like billions and billions of shares are real today. So it's also creating a bit of a language of how people also communicate. So we're seeing a really interesting, um, you know, integration into direct messaging where people are literally having conversations by just sharing videos back and forward uh, with one another. So I think you're going to start to see a lot more of us, a lot, a lot more focusing of us on, on reels as, as time goes on because it's been that successful. That's great. Um, and Caroline, I'm assuming uh, YouTube is kind of in a similar space in terms of the shifts you've seen? I think some, to some extent similar. I think the big thing that I would observe looking at our platform is almost the rise of two contradictory behaviours. One is the short form, which we've just touched on there, and we see that through the rise of short, 70 billion views globally. The other one that I think we've seen in parallel, which seems very contradictory, is the rise of the longer form content. So particularly when we look to CTV, we see longer session times. So now I think 65% of CTV session times are over 21 minutes. So or pieces of content, sorry, consumed is over 21 minutes. So that's like your average sitcom length. And when we look at creators like Mr. Beast, that's typically the sort of length his, his content is. Um, but you also see, we've also seen the rise of like the video essay. It's gone, uh, you've got people creating over two hours in individual pieces of content. I don't know if anyone here is a fan of Mike's Mike and his unhinged recaps. Um, but each of those are over two hours and driving huge amount of views. So I think it's probably those two patterns at the same time, the short and the long. And I think they both sit for us under the, the same theme, which is this explosion of choice for consumers. Um, and we absolutely see both of those. And I mean, I've been doing my role too long now, since 2017. Neither of these things were really on my radar when I came into the role in any big way. And it's been incredible to see like the changes we've had to make as a platform, both from a viewer perspective, but also an advertiser perspective to respond to these viewer habits changing. Um, and they really have. I think the other bits that we're seeing shift, like I guess beyond that kind of meta bit is, um, not meta the company, but, um, <laughs> Is, uh, is thinking through the shifts we're seeing on things like, like sport content. We continue to see a rise on that shoulder content as we talk about, you know, we've got the F1 coming up on Saturday. Yes, if you're a massive fan, you're gonna be engaging to the, the race itself, but you're also gonna be over the course of this week and we see it on our platform, massive increases in terms of the pre-match hype, post-match, whether it's highlights, but whether it is also the deep dives and the analysis that comes post that. Um, that's another big trend. I think in the last one we heard um, about multilingual audiences and kind of the rise of those. We're definitely seeing that reflected in our content and the non-English language content consumed. So there's some specific content trends that kind of sit within that I think's really interesting. Um, but definitely the biggest one is that, that just that rise across both long and short at the same time. I've definitely been one of those ones with the short form content. My short attention span absolutely loves spending a bit of time on on short form video content platforms. Um, <laughs> as a follow up question, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to you, Maddie. Um, so how do you think uh, video providers strike the right balance between um, delivering value to consumers and generating revenue from advertisers? Yeah, so balance is really hard. I think first and foremost, it's, you know, partnering with the right, um, with the right people, partnering with local content if you're a local advertiser looking to dive deep um, in terms of that kind of local affiliation that you can do with things such as sport, um, do such things, you know, with some of the, the dream homes with Block, some of that integration stuff you can do is amazing to bring that brand experience and make those ads feel more immersive. Um, I think from our uh, perspective as an SSP is the hygiene. So I think, you know, not doing back-to-backs, frequency capping where you can, um, you know, competitive separation is critical. Don't have five car ads. That's back also to back. where there were a lot of challenges in the past too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and it's so. getting better, um, and it's it's definitely an improving. Um, and you know, we Magnite try to drive that best practice as much as we can. Um, but really, I think you know the balance, and you know, SBS work really hard on this. Um, you know, making advertising feel good. You know, looking for things like organic breaks. Um, looking, you know, for particular contextual ads within those programs being picky. Um, so I think we've got a long way to go and I think um, ad experience is, you know, the priority for every broadcaster at the moment. Yeah, I love that. Um, Brett, SBS, um, there's been a few updates on your end in terms of engagement, like bringing in that consumer engagement. Uh, can you give us an update 
at all? Yeah, absolutely. So um, to what Maddie was alluding to previously, from, from an audience perspective for us, um, you know, really is very much audience first. Across SBS On Demand, we have an incredibly engaged audience who love to give us feedback. Um, but at the same time, it's also thinking about how that premium UX drives a premium advertising experience at the same time. So at the beginning of this year, we launched um, the SBS Opt Out program, which allows audiences to opt out of QSR gambling and alcohol advertising on the platform. So really ensuring that not only are we continuing our approach to responsible advertising within the audience, but also making the platform as customizable as it can possibly be. So we've had about a th over a thousand opt-ins on that, but really thinking about how we allow audiences to control their experience from that perspective. Um, I think to the point earlier around value, um, you know, for us it's really how do we think from an audience first mindset across everything, whether it's the content, whether it's the UX, whether it's the advertising experience. Um, you know, Caroline, your point earlier around multicultural audiences, like from our perspective, we build things out to ensure that we're able to engage multicultural Australia. So we have a multilingual login for SBS On Demand that actually allows audiences to log in in their native language and gain an entirely translated experience of the platform. So for that, we're seeing really nice growth across it, but at the same time, just speaking to the earlier question around consumption, we're absolutely seeing those shifts happen across platform at the moment. We're in the middle of the TDF right now um, and we're seeing over 70% growth year on year. So those digital shifts are happening um, pretty consistently. So broadly across the SBS business, it's a really interesting time to not only look at how consumers treat platforms and what they believe is the value exchange for advertising, but also for their time spent on free platforms like SBS On Demand, but also thinking about, you know, how do we ramp up audience engagement? How do we ensure that if we bring you in for a headline program like Alone Season 2, like the World Cup in 2026, how do we ensure that the platform and the UX is set up to recommend your next favourite show across those 15,000 hours that we have on the platform? I think as well that touches on what I like about that. Also, it touches on the fact that I don't think it is necessarily a balance where two things are at either end and you've got to trade off consumers versus advertisers. I think when it's working really well is when it's working for both. Um, I mean, within YouTube, we kind of think about it from three kind of core groups. You've obviously got the consumer and the audience. You've got the advertiser, but you've also got the content creator, and that might be an endemic content creator. It might be a major publishing house who uses us as a broadcast channel. Um, but across those three groups, it's got to deliver for all three. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Um, and I think that that's where it isn't necessarily having to trade off. Like, you can make incredible ads that people want to watch. Like, when we look at our um, YouTube leaderboard for ads, you see that the top 10 ads are, on average, well over two minutes long, up from about 45 seconds a few years ago. And that's because we're making there's great content being made. But I also think a bit to the panel earlier, Different advertisers are looking for different things. Yeah. So an advertiser who's trying to drive reach or saliency, the ad or the consumer they want to reach in the moment is going to be very different to somebody who's looking to drive consideration. And I think the closer we are starting to get to be able to provide ads to optimise to that end outcome, I think as was touched on in the last one, I think that starts to mean you're making less of a trade-off because it's not trying to reach all consumers with all of the, like just the standard set of advertising, the formats are going to mm -hmm. differ, the bidding's going to differ. And from a consumer perspective, the ads you want to get served are going to differ depending on your context. So the more yeah. we can use signals to say, do you know what, you're in a short, you're in a moment on your mobile on the bus, that's going to look different to when you're in a lean back experience consuming for me, YouTube on your CTV. Um, and I think the key there that is going to continue to drive that is, and it's going to be one of the most <laughs> overused ones, I guess, of the, of the year, but AI is going to be the thing that's going to let us get a little bit closer to that old cliche of right ad to the right person at the right time. And I think that's true for both advertisers and viewers. I'm just going to add to that. <laughs> we certainly see that um, on Meta. We call that connected delivery. So the ability to serve the right ad to the right person, to your point, Carolyn, based on what they're doing. So more lean back, more likely to be perceptive to a non-skippable format where you know, it will add to the experience. And I think relevancy and personalised ads is another thing that adds layers. So consumers seeing more ads that they care about and things that they want to see. Absolutely. That's a nice segue into um, the next topic, video um, formats and AI. Um, so the first um, first one on this one, I might um, throw to you, Maddie. Um, <laughs> sorry, sorry I, just as you're taking a glass of water, but that's all right. Um, Excuse me. Yeah. So, um, Shoppable video ads. So, yes. how 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 are new formats such as shoppable video ads 
um, changing the video landscape. Um, we have recently seen out, um, obviously, the IAB in the US, um, uh, in the US, the effectiveness of shoppable ads across CTV. What do you think? Um, I think in Australia it's only just beginning. I think it's bloody exciting, really, um, in terms of what's going to happen. Um, first and foremost, I think the, the TV itself, uh, Samsung, um, LG are looking to, you know, monetize the front screen better. Uh, Samsung has just launched the interactive ads on the front screen, turn it on, you can go through and click through to an ad. Um, Prime Video Ads, I think, launched a couple of days ago. Um, I think the only way is up in terms of that full opportunity for that full funnel experience as a logged in user, being able to hopefully Absolutely. in the future click through to ads, click to cart. I think that's really, really exciting. Um, I think in terms of um, what the broadcasters are investing is in is assets beyond the TVC whilst you're, you, you have your TV on. Um, the Olympics, I think there's some really exciting stuff that will be happening with, you know, kind of pause ads or interactive ads um, within um, the apps. Um, I think it's a new space for us um, and a space that we'll be investing in and it will drive that further value and engagement. I think it's awesome and really exciting. It might be a nice hot topic for the next summit. Yeah. Um, Caroline, do you have um, any insight into in, in terms of shoppable uh, video ads across YouTube or is it...? I mean, we absolutely have formats that will allow for it for advertisers who want to. I think that when we look at YouTube more generally, we know that some people are going there to research before they buy. I think something like 50% of consumers say that they will research, um, use, use video to research before they will make a purchase. So I think the interesting bit is going to be combining those signals with the ability to have more interactivity yeah. for the advertisers who care about that. So for us, we've got pause ads, you can send to mobile. So if you don't want to interrupt your viewing experience on the big screen, but you want to do something on your second screen, you can. Um, I'd say it's still relatively nascent. I think from an advertiser perspective, QR codes is another one that I mean, COVID obviously brought back QR codes from the dead. And I think that those we're continuing to see being used. Um, but definitely an interesting place for advertisers who want to combine that contextual piece about people who are there shopping in the moment, I think that gets really powerful, particularly on the big screen in the living room. 100%. Uh, so what about uh, the use of AI? Um, so we know from a media planning and buying perspective, AI technologies are basically in full swing and have been utilised for a little while now, even though we are obviously starting to, you know, harness more of them. Um, but from a creative um, perspective, um, there seems to be a lot of hesitation using um, AI generative tools, uh, particularly of obviously across across video. Um, what do you see as the main challenges, and what solutions can help bridge the gap? I might um, chuck to you, Paul, if that's okay. Yes, we can. I'm happy to kick it off. Um, I think we hopefully are moving to a place where AI is going to be embraced and seen as a way to enrich storytelling. Um, I think. I was at a client council session a couple of weeks ago and it was established that it was going to be human versus human plus machine versus human versus machine. So everyone in the room felt a lot better about themselves. Um, <laughs> but I do think that uh, it is quite new and it's quite nuanced. And so, you know, we are seeing, you know, a lot of disruptors in the space make, make moves, but heritage brands are going to, it is going to take time for them to understand how they can integrate that into, you know, into their workflows and, and their guidelines and their systems and all that kind of, all those kind of uh, logistics. We've had, you know, people like Coca-Cola come and stand on a stage with us in Cannes and, and talk about how they are thinking about it. So we know that there is, um, you know, definite opportunity. I think we're starting to see some really interesting Gen AI space, uh, sorry, Gen AI development around understanding what creative is working, so creative analysis tools. So I think that might be an initial way for marketers, particularly heritage marketers, to think about how they can use Gen AI not to take over the creative process, but certainly in the instance to understand how they can evaluate their creative, particularly as they're building for more screens and more video placements. So I think that might be a good intro. And I think picking up some of the smaller, um, you know, sort of performance, lower funnel type activity to sort of whet the appetite before we start to get the big brand building stuff. But the hope is they can use it as a way to take the pressure off the, the smaller stuff to do the more strategic work. Absolutely. There have been some amazing examples of AI-generated ads and in, in, in cars, as you yeah. um, said. I think you um, we were talking about the... The Toys R Us one, right? Toys R Us example. 60-second um, film, yeah. It was bloody brilliant. Yeah. Um, 
YouTube perspective? I think that, I mean, at very high level, as we think from, when, from at very high level, you're not, no marketer is competing with AI, they're competing against another marketer using AI. And I think that is gonna remain true. Um, I think that a lot of, crea there is a lot of AI that is being incorporated within even your bigger creative agencies currently. Um, we make a bit of a differentiation between, I guess, what you might call tools and taste. Tools being what you're doing to scale your work that you'll be done. Taste being what is that creative idea, that kind of core of that storytelling that sits at the top. And I think AI will play a different role in both of those. So when you think about tools, you've got things like um, asset generation. You know, there's some talk on the last panel around the fragmentation of media makes it bloody hard to have an asset for you know every consumer moment that you need. This is a perfect place for AI to play a role and take some of that legwork out. Um, you mentioned that kind of some of your lower funnel, kind of more performance play, like video, like that are building off your, your bigger story. Fantastic places to start. I think that within taste, creative analysis, absolutely, and a lot are already using this, like they are absolutely already leaning in here. Um, I think there's also some great examples of actually where you use it not just from an efficiency perspective, but to enhance value. I, you know, I loved the last year the orange Alela Blues. Has anyone seen that? It won at Cannes Lion last week. It basically was incredible, incredible piece of work where they basically showed the. It was ahead of the Euros last. Uh, sorry, the World, the Women's World Cup last year, and they showed the um, an ad showing the the French national football team knocking it out of the park. It was the blokes doing it, it was brilliant. It was tying into the emotion that you feel watching it. And then they showed actually how they used AI and it was actually the female, the female players playing. And it was an incredible way to use technology, deep fake technology, to bring to life an idea they couldn't have done historically. So I think there is a mixture. I think there's definitely the kind of the tools bit and I think that is just gonna explode. The main bit I'd say on that is there is technology there that six months ago you probably wouldn't have used. I mean, things like language dubbing six months ago, yeah, was it good? Now we've just used it in some of our Google Creative globally, and you, in blind tests, you wouldn't know the difference. So I think uh, keeping an eye on that and quality will increase. I then think how creative agencies start to bring it in to enhance their storytelling, but at the core of it is still gonna be humans who can understand emotion, who can pull that, that context into being and I think for the moment at least def we definitely see those kind of those two key areas 100 percent. I um, also think from a from a budgeting perspective I heard on the the, the previous panel um, budget can sometimes obviously be a barrier to you know build those list of that l massive list of video formats that are available in market um, so I um, um, on that it's um, it's just it it will do wonders for um, the small to medium businesses, um, but as well we I'm I'm really excited to see big brands kind of lean into that leaning heavily to that space and start to utilize it. I think it's the important differentiation between your top end of town who've yeah. got the money and the ability to invest in the way they can in brand storytelling and who really do see their creative as a competitive as a way to drive competitive advantage i think you have got a massive longer tail like you know my local florist who wants to have be able to use video to let me know they've opened a new store whatever like that sort of stuff you're opening the gateway to video advertising for so many brands and i think that is super exciting but i do think there's a difference between your big brands for whom creative and their storytelling is a core part of how they're going to drive that advantage versus longer tail who just want to drive saliency and have a way of reaching people through sight, sound, emotion. Yep. I totally agree with that one. Um, one last question before we uh, jump to Q&A, if there is any time. I think we have a little bit of time left. Um, so leveraging the ratings and audience measurement, sorry, leaving the ratings and audience measurement debate aside. <laughs> We're going to leave that one aside today. Um, do Thank you think you. there are any um, industry do you think, as an industry, we are improving the way that marketers can access the impact of their spend across different video inventory types? Yes, <laughs> uh, like unequivocally, yes. Like I, th I think, you know, it, we, we've we've come quite a ways, as I spoke to earlier, of sort of looking at metrics that are vanity based for the sake of ticking boxes, and we're now starting to shift into actual real world metrics that actually affect shifting the opportunity for that brand within that campaign. Um, I think that, you know, our ability to 
attribute um, where we're at right now it has, has come such a long way in the last even two to three years, I would say. And I think that from a brand perspective, it's just understanding what works in terms of the metrics that you're looking for to create success because we can all get drowned in digital metrics. We all have. Every client has a, a different set of KPIs. There's a different approach for each campaign. How do you ensure that that success is actually... Uh, communicated across the board. I think that, you know, from, from that perspective, we've come a long way. It's just trying to get through the myriad of opportunities that there are from a measurement perspective to ensure what works specifically for your campaign or specifically for your brand. There's always new measurement coming in too. Like so the cost per viewable impression. Yeah. yeah. I also remember, um, you know, being a buyer for 12 years, Nestle with Sarah Gallen, trying to run a market mix modelling report for digital. Oh, I think 99% of it had to be excluded five years ago. Mm. So, you That's know... It's definitely changed a lot. It's changed a lot. Um, digital c always came out as ineffective. TV was too expensive. So I think a lot of things have changed since then and the, the metrics are smarter. And, you know, being able to unify more of those metrics in the future, you know, w even across total TV with Voz Streaming, I think that's going to be really powerful. It's going to bring value it's, and you'll be able to learn better from it. So I think it's come a long way and we've got to... You know, we've got a long way to go. And I think just to add to that, like, it's it's not without its challenges, right? Like, it's not without, like, from a market mix modelling perspective, like, from an SBS side of things, there are certain things that market mix modelling doesn't take into account in relation to our platform, right? That we are a multicultural broadcaster, that we only have five minutes of advertising per hour. Those things don't fall into that, but it is a lot more accountable than it was previously. So I think that it's a constant evolution of those things and how do we integrate the metrics that we're looking for and ensure that we're evaluating partners on their merits. Yeah, absolutely. And I think for us, it's just getting clients to move closer to business metrics. So moving away from just media metrics and focusing what are the business KPIs. Often that's quite hard because they'll give you more than one. Especially <laughs> with like, the privacy. Well, <laughs> no two plans can look the same. But, you know, essentially the closer you get to business outcomes, the closer you get to, yeah, to getting to the, the source of truth and work out what's working. Absolutely. It's becoming more... MMM is definitely becoming more and more important as, as time goes and especially as the privacy kind of yeah. um, evolution evolves. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much for, for answering my questions. But we might chuck to Q&A if there is any questions on Slido. There's a couple. I might be able to get through. Right? Awesome. Um, I am going to build on measurement. <laughs> guess, guess what? Um, but I guess you've talked a little bit about the improvements from a, you know, pulling the data together. There have been a lot of global initiatives. I guess there's questions around, you know, bringing broadcaster and, you know, others together. Um, Caro and Paul, I know both Google and Meta have done a lot of work globally in the origin trials in different areas. Caro, you've obviously got things coming into Iris. So I'd, I'd, I'd love to know from both of you, um, I'm, I'm just paraphrasing someone's question here and taking it over. Um, <laughs> I mean, how you see that coming into this market, if it's sort of front and centre in your thinking, um, those sort of industry-wide pieces that you're now feeding into. To be fair, it's actually happening at a, at a, like a global level yeah. from our point of view, so it's not really happening local, so I'm probably not best to comment from a local point of view. Yep. Um, I don't know if you can from a local point of view. Oh, man, I can have a stab. Um, I think... Things like the origin and the halo trials for those who aren't across, that's kind of UK and the US, taking some of the WFA's principles on cross-media measurement and trying to actually deliver on a true cross-media measurement. Um, origin, we expect to be getting some of the early results come out later this year, which is really exciting. It's been a long, a long project. Um, I think we believe it's really important. I think we've got some fundamental principles of measurement, like is it transparent, is it inclusive, is it robust? And I think what's been really interesting about that is the ability to bring a number of different partners on that journey. The bit gay that I think is really notable about some of those initiatives is they are very advertiser-led. Like if I look at the mm. UK, you've got ISBA and advertisers really driving that conversation, which is in some ways forcing the compromise and the coming together of all the various other players, which I think has been really important and really critical. I think it's also really interesting that in the UK, they are looking at a model where advertisers will pay as a percentage on their, on their media. Um, I'm not sure in this market, like I think everyone agrees it's important, but when it comes to 
will everybody, not just the publisher, but will everybody put the skin in the game to make that a reality? I'm not sure we're at that point yet, if I'm being really honest. And we're also a smaller market. There are smaller ad dollars than there are in the US and the UK. So to fund the pat, like some of those fixed costs don't drop significantly with the size of the market. So I think there are some practical considerations alongside that. But I mean, I'd love to be wrong, but I don't think that we're at that point here at the moment. And I think there are, I mean, I'm part of the Video Futures Collective, which I think is an effort, which I know SBS are also involved in, um, trying to just work through, oh, there is a commonality that we can get to. Are there ways that we can improve this without going to that extent? Um, but I mean, it is, it's really hard. Um, and I think that it can't just be solved by a segment of the market. Fantastic. Um, and I think from Horigen and Halo, we'll get like we'll get lessons from that as well that we can. Hopefully well, and hopefully, I mean they've been five years on the journey, right? So where they started out is not where they're ending up. So I think being able to shortcut some of that, hope, or, you know, yeah, it'd be great as and when we get some of those lessons through. And the advertisers paying, we always get excited with that. Um, well, well, I mean, I think it's been a lot of people paying through the journey, <laughs> but at the end point. Yeah. Um, one last one, I guess we talked about AI, um, the great stuff it can do. There's obviously risk of um, creating ads that are scams. You know, we're having a lot of discussions of how we stop scams in the market. Maybe this might be one for you. Like, how do you think the tech will um, improve, keep up with the, you know, blocking or stopping of scams coming through the pipes? Yeah, so I guess we've been using machine learning for a creative perspective for years, um, being able to identify naughty keywords or being able to bucket particular categories to the IAB standards. Um, we, have, we have a tool uh, within our ad server um, that helps to identify ads um, based on keywords and being able to bucket them together. So we are continuing to learn and to invest into this technology to ensure that there's no fraudulent ads. You know, we have a lot of tech in place to try to prevent that and we'll keep continuing to invest in it. So it's certainly a key priority for us and it's certainly a product that we would want all of our broadcasters to use to try to uh, prevent any fraudulent ads coming through the systems. Fantastic. Thank you. I love that. Thank you very much, guys. Give them a round of applause.